Hello everyone. I would like to invite you to join with me on this mini tour of the Tabernacle of Moses, the most significant model of salvation that God ever gave his people. And as we try to understand both its structure and its meaning, I think you will discover a lot of significance to our own faith today. And so welcome and join me as we travel through the Tabernacle. The first thing for us to consider is what were the dimensions of this whole uh, structure? Well, they measured everything by cubits. Now you may say, what is a cubit? Well, let me show you exactly what a cubit must have been like. If you take this tape and go to 45 centimeters, that's approximately how long a cubit was. The way that they measured the cubit was a little bit more uh, practical from the tip of the elbow to the tip of the tallest finger. Uh, eventually it got standardized, but that's how they measured the tabernacle. So how long, how wide, how big was this tabernacle? Well, the, the width of the outer court is approximately 23 meters. This is converting the cubits into meters. The length is about 45 meters. So this is not a small structure, it's a pretty big structure. This tent proper is about 5 meters wide and about 5 meters tall and about 13 meters long. So we're not dealing here with a little pathfinder tent or a little camp out tent. This is a fairly big size structure. The, the curtain or the fencing, which is actually just white linen cloth with all these poles around, was about two meters tall, a little over two meters tall. So no one could actually jump over the fence and they were well fastened into the ground. There was only one way to enter the tabernacle and that is from here. These embroidered curtains, the first of three embroidered curtains was the main way by which somebody could enter into the tabernacle. Here's the thing, while you're coming from your tent towards the tabernacle, everybody can see you and they can tell by the sacrifice you brought what your problem was. But once you entered inside, it's just between you and God and the priest who mediated that sacrifice. This open area that we have here is known as the outer court. In uh, biblical Christian speak, it's often known as the courtyard, but it's really just open space. That's where worshippers can come in. That's where the Levites did their work. That's where the priests did their works. Now there were mainly two pieces of furniture in this outer courtyard. This uh, big box like thing here that you see, this was the altar of sacrifice. This was not a small box. It was about two meters uh, square. They had a ramp that actually helped them to go up uh, to, to do the sacrifice. There was a grill at the bottom here and they had an open space on one side so they could rake out the ash and maybe put some more fire underneath. This was the most active uh, point in the entire uh, sanctuary. Every morning, every evening, a sacrifice was offered here, and then there were the individual sacrifices. Most sacrifices were animal sacrifices, uh, like lambs and cattle, and mediated by the priests uh, around. But people could also bring uh, farm produce. They could also bring flour and cakes that were used and burned on this altar the altar of burnt offering. That was a simple name. We are still in the courtyard, so let's go back down to the courtyard. We talked about the altar of burnt offering. The other main piece of furniture was a big uh, basin. Uh, it's more like a small tank where water was kept. And they washed the sacrifices there. The priests had to wash their hands and feet before they would enter in here. And so it was a very important thing. Now, most of the artistic impressions is of an open a tank like this but this is the desert and the chances of water staying here very long uh, would be minimal and where would they refill the water and so it's most probable that it was actually a covered tank with some kind of faucets all around so that they can use the water this was the only source of cleaning up that you have in the entire sanctuary once you leave the courtyard then you come to the tent proper known in Hebrew simply as the Mishkan 
Now for people outside of this uh, structure, with the curtains being two meters tall, all they could see was uh, this uh, animal skin. <laughs> There's a lot of debate about what animal was actually used, but this was the outer covering. Apparently it was uh, a bit waterproof and that's why it was on the outside, but it was a plain, maybe some pattern like this, but it was plain skin. And so when you see, you know, this uh, didn't look so grand, it just uh, skin. But as you begin to peel off the skin, you realize that there are four coverings for this Mishkan. And so you remove the outer layer, that animal skin, and you'll find uh, scarlet. This is not actually cloth. This is made, uh, woven together from uh, various animal fabric and then uh, dyed scarlet. And when you remove that, you have a plain, simple, white covering. You know, just as white as could be. Not perfectly white, it was more like ivory or off-white. And this would be the third covering. The innermost covering was the beautiful one. Now I put it upside down because that's how it would have been seen for anybody who could enter here. Incidentally, only the priest could go in there. And this was an embroidered covering with uh, pictures of angels or cherubim as they were called. And this was the inner covering. So from the inside, you would see this. From the outside, you would see this. ready to enter the Mishkan. We're ready to enter the tabernacle proper. Now it had two chambers, an inner chamber known as the Holy of Holies, we'll come back to that, and an outer chamber simply called the Holy, implying that it's a holy place. Uh, the priests, the normal ordinary priests, the high priests, and even the Levites, they did their work in here. And the entrance was through this curtain, also embroidered, largely white pattern with embroidery of blue, scarlet, and, uh, and so on. And through that, they would walk in here and meet three pieces of furniture. On the northern wall, you have what is called the table of presence. This is where 12 loaves of bread, kind of like pita bread, were preserved as a way of reminding Israel that all of them were covered by the presence of God. Jesus would uh, apply this to himself later. On the southern wall, you have the lampstand which is known as the menorah. And the menorah had seven branches. It was the only source of light inside this entire sanctuary. And then you have a small altar here where incense was burned. This was called the golden altar or the altar of incense. And the smoke from the, those incense would rise and go over the top of this curtain into the next chamber. Once you pass through the holy place, you would go through another embroidered curtain into this most sacred space. In Hebrew, Holy of Holies, literally translated. It was uh, the idea of the holiest. This was seen as the throne room, the presence of God. And only the high priest could ever enter in here. And he was allowed in there only once a year on a day known as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And inside there was just one piece of furniture, uh, a box with uh, golden angels mounted on the top that became known as the Ark of the Covenant because it housed the items that represented the covenant. This was God's space. This was a little less holy, so more humans involved. This was a little less holy and more humans were involved. And then, of course, the outside of the camp. No one could come here. Even the high priest, if he went in there during... Uh, the wrong time, the wrong day of the year, he could end up uh, dead by walking into that presence of God. Even on Yom Kippur, he has to prepare himself specially before he could enter the Holy of Holies. In that Holy of Holies, there was just this piece of furniture known as the Ark of the Covenant. The box itself was made of acacia wood and plated completely or covered with uh, um, plates of gold. And then it had a covering with the angels mounted that was pure gold. This entire piece was one solid uh, piece of gold. Uh, this alone was pretty heavy. And the imagination that I had as a kid that you know four priests could carry this ark was probably not correct. 
it most likely took uh, many priests to move this ark from place to place. Uh, the covering may, they may have actually had to carry it by itself because it would have weighed so much. Think about it, it's about a meter and a half long, about half a meter wide and about um, maybe 15, 20 centimeters thick and then the golden angels at the top, how much would that gold weigh? But this cover is known as the cover of intercession, the cover of atonement, in Hebrew, the kaporet. This is the idea that all intercession of God culminate, climax in this cover. But what is also interesting is what's inside the ark. We are told that they place the tablets that God gave to Moses, uh, the, the so-called terms of the covenant that included the, the Ten Commandments as we know them today. Also included inside that box was a pot of manna. Now this pot of manna represented the provisions of God. For 40 years, that manna came every day except on Shabbat. And this allowed them to never go hungry because it was always there available. And then there was Aaron's rod. There was a competition as to who should be the high priest. And God showed through a test of uh, shepherd's staff that Aaron would be the one. His dead shepherd's rod came to life overnight with flowers and fruit uh, of almonds. And this represented the choices and elections of God for special ministries such as the priest. So Aaron's rod was in there. Uh, the pot of manna was in there. The, the tablets of the covenant were in there. And then this was covered by the kaporet, which symbolized the presence and the seat and the throne of God. The big question is, what is the point of all this? What was being taught here? The activities in the courtyard are centered around the sacrifice altar. And so the main idea of this area is sacrifice. Sacrifice was the substitute for human sin. By bringing a sacrifice, we are told that they were able to receive forgiveness and atonement from God. And as long as there was a sacrifice burning, uh, the presence of God as accepting Israel despite their faults and failures uh, was uh, enacted in this every single day, every morning, every evening and every individual experience. All of this showed that God has accepted the sacrifice and so he has accepted us. This uh, front chamber, the holy place, the main thing that happens here is what was called the tamid. The activity that went on every day, the burning of incense, the lighting of the lamps, and the presence every single day of the bread, it was like a mediation exercise. Because there's light, because there is incense which represented prayer, because there is bread which represented the sustenance of the people, it's like God saying, I'm taking care of you. Okay, so you don't have to worry. I will provide. I will care for you. I will mediate the effects and the benefits of the sacrifice here in this presence, right before the throne of God. When we enter the Holy of Holies, because of the Yom Kippur uh, celebration, the main activity here is renewal. Because what happened on Yom Kippur is that this entire structure got cleaned out. All the symbolic and metaphoric transfer of sin that occurred throughout the year, sin was moving from the camp into the courtyard, into the holy place, and eventually into the presence of God. On Yom Kippur, it was reversed. It's like God saying, your sin is gone. The record for your sin is gone. Of course, for them, it was just one day, and they had to repeat the cycle over and over. Sacrifice, mediation, renewal, and cleansing. When we get to the New Testament, this tabernacle, this sanctuary, became the very model of the ministry and the salvation work of Jesus. In what way? Well, Christ is described as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the sacrifice through whom forgiveness and atonement can be made. And as long as we access that sacrifice, we have a perfect standing before God. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He is our sacrifice. When we get into this holy place, this same Jesus is described as our advocate. 
My little children, says John, I wish that you do not sin, but if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He's the one who mediates in God's presence and our behalf. He's the one who claims, I am the bread of life. He's the one who claims, I am the light of the world. He is the one who brings our prayers into the presence of God. And then in this final chamber, Jesus is that king, that judge who sits on his throne to welcome his people into his kingdom. In Revelation, we see the lamb that was slain come into the presence of God and sit on the throne with God and he will rule for eternity. And so this was not just a piece of architecture. This was God's way of teaching about salvation hundreds of years before Jesus actually appeared. And so in Christ, these elements, these symbols were finally fulfilled.